Good morning, everybody. Happy National Book Festival. We're delighted to have you all here in the room. My name is Shelley Lowe. I am chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities. I am Navajo. I am originally from Ganado, Arizona, and I currently live and work here in Washington, D.C. I am just so excited to welcome you all this morning to our conversation with Joy Harjo and Michaela Goad about their new gorgeous book, Remember. Following our conversation, you will all have a chance to ask Joy and Michaela some questions. I also encourage you to join both of them for book signing. It will be in Hall DE, Level 2 North Building, starting at noon. Um, but let's meet our fantastic panelists today. Joy Harjo is a member of the Muscogee Creek Nation and is a former U.S. Poet Laureate. Her work captures brilliantly how each of us is connected how we draw from our ancestors, and how we write our own stories. Joy is the recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Native Writers Circle of the Americas, the Wallace Stevens Award from the Academy of American Poets, and the American Indian Distinguished Achievement in the Arts Award, among many, many other recognitions. She also plays the saxophone and is one of the coolest people I have ever met. <laughs> Michaela Goat is Clinkett from Alaska, and she is a New York Times best-selling illustrator, the recipient of a Caldecott Medal, and the winner of the American Indian Youth Literature Award for Best Picture Book. Michaela's work focuses on indigenous children's literature. Her illustrations have helped her to better understand and share her culture. Michaela lives in Sitka, Alaska, which she describes as a magical island on the edge of a wide, wild sea. Thank you, Michaela and Joy, for joining us. Um, we are going to talk about the book, but beforehand, Joy, I'm going to turn it over to you to read a few bits of the book. Thank you, Shelley, and it's so good to see you see you up here, and uh, and to be here too with Michaela, and uh, and to be here with you. And I'm glad that we're in person right now. But be careful. Yeah, you still have to be careful out there. This book started with a poem, and uh, the poem started years ago. This poem has accompanied me almost my whole journey of being a poet. I had no plans to become a poet. I was going to be a painter like my grandmother, Naomi Harjo, and uh, I wound up writing poetry as part of native rights movements and being a young woman. I was a young woman going to the University of New Mexico and so on. And uh, word got out that I was writing poetry, and someone came to me and said, could, could you write a poem to help young people, to help young natives? And this poem happened. And what I've come to know about art and about poetry and about uh, music is that, you know, often the writers, the writers and the composers are, we're like the messengers. We say, okay, we'll take it down. We'll shape it. But we don't often I, I, we don't often know exactly how or why, and I've come to realize that this poem was given to me. Certainly, it's not just for me, but it, it has helped me along the way, because it, it urges us to remember to remember who we are, and that's going to be especially important in these times, which are amping up, and um, is to remember who we are and that we are the earth. Remember. Remember the sky you were born under. Know each of the stars' stories. Remember the moon, know who she is. Remember the sun's birth at dawn, that is the strongest point of time. Remember sundown and the giving away tonight. Remember your birth, how your mother struggled to give you form and breath. You are evidence of her life and her mother's and hers. Remember your father, he is your life also. Remember the earth whose skin you are. Red earth, black earth, yellow earth, white earth, brown earth, we are earth. Remember the plants, trees, animal life, who all have their tribes, their families, their histories too. Talk to them, listen to them. They are alive poems. 
Remember the wind. Remember her voice. She knows the origin of this universe. Remember that you are all people, and all people are you. Remember that all is in motion, is growing as you. Remember that you are this universe, and this universe is you. Remember. That was perfect. That was so lovely. I think Michaela and I both said, we just want to sit and listen to Joy. <laughs> we don't have to ask questions or talk to. <laughs> but Joy, I want, to, I want to start with a question that you asked um, for us to kind of think about, and for, for Michaela and I and, and Joy, you as well, to even remember for ourselves. What was that book in, as a child that you really liked, that you were drawn to? And Michaela, if you know yours, you can talk about yours. Too. Oh, what age man. You? Like little, little? Yes. Or? Well, like what book like really, you know, inspired you? Oh, man. You know what I remember? Those little golden books. Um, <laughs> yeah. I didn't come from a family really that went to the library. And so those little golden books were in the grocery store. I'm trying to remember the names of some of them. There was one with a really sad little duck, right? Or yeah. <laughs> or there's the ugly the duckling. <laughs> no, it makes me wonder. I, I was of the generation that grew up with Dick and Jane mm -hmm. yeah. and, um, you know, nursery rhymes that came out of England that were very, you know, like these political potent rhymes, but that's not how they were taught to us. And the one book, though, when I was eight was a book of poems with illustrations, mm -hmm. uh, Louis Untermeyer's Golden Treasury of Poetry. Mm -hmm. And I remember a lot of that artwork, and I remember the poems. And, uh, but yeah, that's, that's what I kind of grew up with is, and then, you know, you go to school and, and, and you read, well, Dick and Jane. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite word was cookie when we were, <laughs> when we were learning to how to read, and then I took off. There's more where those came from. <laughs> yeah. I remember, uh, I forget the name, it's like the, the bear and the strawberry and the mouse. Um, like, then that, that might be what it's called. I don't, but like the, the mouse that disguises the strawberry to hide from the bear. I remember that one. I remember oh, the rainbow cool. fish, which makes sense. A lot of forest and ocean books based on where I live. So I just remember like those kinds. Um, I don't think I read the golden ones growing up. Those are very evocative. Yeah. It's yeah. almost like what you're doing now. I know, that's, that's, that <laughs> kind of makes yeah. sense, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, they were wonderful. And I, too, I learned to read uh, with Dick and Jane books. Um, growing up on the reservation, right, no public library, yeah. really, but you had the school library. And my mom was the librarian, so of course oh, we always had yeah. school. We always had books around. <laughs> um, but Joy, talk about a little bit in the, in the um, Author's note in the book, you talk about poems as pockets or envelopes that can hold dreams. Tell us a little bit more about that and what you're, what you're telling us about poems and holding our dreams. I think I came to, I, what I liked about poetry is that <clears throat> it was a place, <clears throat> excuse me, to hide. It was almost like I was a little kid that would hide, often outside and then the closet. <laughs> My drawings were all over the wall, but I liked quiet. I liked to have space. And for me, poetry is like that, with words. You make an area that one of the main, um, you know, you use images, color, everything, nature. There would be no, be no poems without the natural world. We would not be here. We are the natural world. But all of that, you know, you construct a poem, or a moment, or several moments, and you can have all different kinds of time in it. It can be, you can have dreams in it, and all of it can come together in one construction. And you can carry it around with you, you can write it, you can put it in, carry it in your heart from memory. But if you read it, it opens up something that you may not totally understand, but it feeds you, it's, it feeds your spirit. Yeah, yeah I like that. Michaela, um, you've illustrated this um, book, this poem, and I often say, because you know, we're the humanities and we get mistaken for the National Endowment for the Arts all the time. <laughs> and I say that art is a way to translate humanities. Mm -hmm. And what you've done is you've translated visually this poem. How did you and Joy start to work together? And what, 
what inspires you to do these kinds of illustration, illustrations? Yeah. Um, well, I've learned over the course of, I don't know, almost 10 books now, that I'm drawn to these more, um, I guess, huge concepts. And to me, they seem a bit more like cosmological almost, which at, on one hand, it can kind of be daunting. But at the other, on the same time, it's, it's limitless. You can tackle in so many different directions, which is what I've always loved. Um, and, and for this book in particular, remember, the, our partnership came about in, I think, a pretty standard publishing way. They'd acquired the text. They reached out to me and asked if I would be interested in taking it on. And some books, you sort of hem and haw, and you, you weigh the pros and the cons of taking on a project if you're the right illustrator or if you have enough time. Uh, and then occasionally, you get some that you're just like, I'll do whatever it takes, you know, I'll, yeah, just sign me up. So that was definitely remember. Um, and so then we started working together. And from the beginning, Joy was just incredibly gracious and welcoming into that space because, like she was saying, it's been accompanying her her whole journey. Uh, so to be able to step into that world with her and to be welcomed was a great gift. Uh, and she was just open to whatever I had, you know, whatever I had in mind, so whatever ideas I came up with, which um, as an illustrator is always, again, another wonderful gift. So uh, there's some different angles that I talked about uh, with the editor too, like should we do, you know, we are the world type thing and like check in with different, uh, different tribes or our communities around the world or around the country. Um, but ultimately, it felt right to sort of um, center it in, in my experience or what I know and the, the land that I know, which is what the poem was, you know, is urging readers to do anyway. So it felt really right. So uh, I used the, you know, the Tlingit community and culture as sort of a, a stepping off point to, and I just imagined the young girl, young Tlingit girl, uh, as she's what starts before she's brought into the world, and then it follows her as she grows up, uh, and as she sort of learns the, the power and the beauty and the community behind her, as she carries that forward. Excellent. You know, you talk about the power and the beauty um, of the character and what she kind of starts to go through in the book. And Joy, you know, you talk a lot about remembering, and this character is asked or reminded to remember all the time. And I think the beauty and power of it is that it's not just for young people, right. that this book is also for adults to remind us we need to remember. But tell us more about that, Joy. What happens if we don't remember? Well, we're in the fix we're in now together. <laughs> <laughs> really. <laughs> but uh, yeah, part of it, I mean, too, Again, memories feed us, and I think that memory is not static. I think uh, memory is not just past. I think it uh, is present, past, and future, and it's all together and in, a, in some way in particular forms. It solidifies, memory solidifies into forms when we tell stories, when we write poetry, when we do art. That's sort of like memory solidified that keeps moving. And I also like to think of what I, I, you know, I love Michaela's work, and I had seen it in, had seen her her art, but we have a friend in common, a Lingat, um, incredible woman, Nora Dallenhauer, who was a linguist, a poet. I, one one of my favorite memories, speaking of memories, was uh, being uh, on a tour at an art, a, a writer's tour with Nora all over Alaska. It was a an Alaska Native Arts Organization out of Anchorage. I can't remember the name. And they put us on tour together, and we had such a good time. We went all over reading poetry and telling stories. So that I, I think of it, too, as kind of a tribute to that, to that memory, to someone who was a great and humble teacher, as most great, all te great teachers are. I don't, can't say all. That's, <laughs> most great teachers are humble, <laughs> you know, not all of them. Uh, but yes, yeah, so I think about it, and this would be right in the pocket. People have talked about translating it. So it has been translated into Muscogee language, and I've sang it. I have a song that will be on my next album that, of singing the poem. And um, it would be cool if we could translate it into Thlingit, mm -hmm. into, other, you know, into other languages. 
Yeah, that would be wonderful. We'd love to see that. You know, Michaela, um, Joy writes, remember you are all people and all people are you. And you spoke a little bit about where you draw uh, from your own culture um, to do some of the illustrations. Particularly, we see Raven, which is very um, important in Clinkit culture. But one of the things that you told me was the universal is in the details. Tell me a little bit more about that, especially as we think of remember you are all people and all people are you. Well, it sort of ties into like what I was mentioning just a little bit ago. Should I, as when I'm starting out with the book, should I root it in my own experience or should I root it in Joy's culture or should I do like the we are the world and, and do all these and just, I'm always trying to get as much representation as I can. Um, but it just didn't feel right for this book. Uh, and so the more I leaned into my own personal experiences, um, the more authentic it felt. And then I hope that that just comes across. So when you say the universals and the details, of course, that's a well-known saying. But I found it to be really true just with picture book illustration. The more I um, did sort of dig into my memory and current experiences, family history, um, cultural traditions, the more inspiration I found. And I feel like that's a pretty natural uh, result. And for that particular um, stanza, the we are all people, or remember you are all people and all people are you, um, that one is actually very closely tied to um, personal experience. It's the line of female uh, dancers. And on the backs of their, their regalia, their dance robes, uh, is the herring woman. And those robes are created uh, a few years ago for the Herring Protectors, which is a local Kixedi, which is our clan group. Uh, and every spring we have a Herring gathering um, to honor and to raise awareness for the, the dwindling Herring population and to get more community involvement and more uh, legislation around fishing uh, legislation. So there's a lot there in that one spread. And so I wanted the, the blankets to tie together and they do, they turn into this ocean spread connecting through story, through culture, but also the individual and also the whole. Uh, so I love sort of doing that with each page. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that particular, that one was really cool because I, I would not have been able to do that spread even a couple years ago. It was only after moving uh, back to Shikla or Sitka uh, and getting more involved with the local clan. Um, so it felt very timely to being able to work on this book. Right, because it also works. It's not a book just being a book, but it continues that. It has, it's directly tied to the hair, you know, mm -hmm. the fish and, and replenishing and, and replenishing memory too. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And Joy, one of the things that you, you talk about is uh, you say that our memories are alive poems. What do you mean by that? And what does it take to bring these poems to life? I don't know exactly. So <laughs> I can come up with something, though. <laughs> no, sometimes, you know, when you're, you're moving along in something, you just get taken over by rhythm and the feel hmm. and the sound. They are alive poems. So what is an alive poem? Well, a poem comes alive when you speak it, when you embody it, when um, you uh, share it. Yeah. And, then and, and, and if you think about it, I mean, I've thought, wondered a lot about what use humans are to Earth, even though we are Earth. I'm thinking, well, you know, what do we do? Our innate thing all humans do is we story gather. You know, like I guess the theme of this, the theme of the book festival, you know, everyone has a story. Every one of us story gathers. And when I was growing up, we'd story gather by standing out in the yard and talking to people or, you know, visiting, going and visiting people, talking on the phone, and now it's texting. A lot of the kids don't want to talk to you, you know, <laughs> by phone. It's texting, internet, emails, you know, but that's what we do. We story gather. We're constantly, constantly gathering stories. And um, so, you know, that's part of it. That's how we renew ourselves, and it's really directly connected to our relationship with the earth. There would be no poems. There would be no poems without the natural world. Think about it. The earth, weather, a lot about the weather, the elements, fire, all of it. Plants, seasons. You know, it may not be nature poems, but nature is, it's everywhere. 
you know, what is this made out of? I mean, even if it's plastic, it's still made out of earth. Yeah. You know, a reorganization of earth elements, you know? Yes, exactly. And Michaela, you, you take this, these alive poems and you literally bring them to life mm -hmm. in your drawings and in your illustrations. How did you start deciding and, and start drawing and mm -hmm. you know, understand that <laughs> this is what you were doing? I ask myself that every time I'm about to make work on a new book. Um, sometimes it's a real struggle. Other times you sort of have these big aha moments. Um, I had a really big aha moment with Remember. Uh, it was reading over uh, her first lines, remember the stars, remember the moon, remember the sun. Uh, and that exact order mirrors the Tlingit creation stories, which we were talking about Raven. Raven is the central figure in creation stories. Uh, and it's this whole canon of um, continuing creation myth and stories centered around Raven. Uh, and first he releases um, the, the stars, and then he releases the moon, and then he releases the sun in that exact order. So I sort of took that as like the sign to keep going with, uh, with the rooting it, you know, the thing uh, experience for, for my experience at least. And so that was a really uh, fun, creative sort of aha moment. And then I just rolled with it. And I love that you didn't really necessarily know what the live poem meant, because when I read that, it really struck a chord. Um, and that's something I love about working with authors. And I guess even if you're authoring and illustrating, is that it's really amazing when the author can distill and distill and distill and condense and condense to a point maybe where they're not even quite sure anymore, but it feels right. And then the illustrator's job is to like, expand that again in a unique way. Um, and so that's always, I think, one of the more uh, really engaging and dynamic factors at play in, in picture books, if not like the core. Yeah. Yeah, sense. exactly. Well, I'm really interested in knowing from both of you what inspires you? you you're you're going to write more books. You're going to draw and illustrate more books. What do you draw inspiration from? Being outside, mm -hmm. pretty much. That's basically it. And and then learning about culture and um, learning about family stories. And mm -hmm. it's fun once you start sort of getting into this frame of mind of story gathering. Like things you didn't really consider before. All of a sudden, there's a whole new, all these worlds of possibility open up and stories, uh, story ideas and inspiration. So it's also a lot of observation, being outside and just observing closely, taking notes when you're outside, seeing what plants grow next to each other, the seasons. Um, I think there's some beauty too in, in getting to know a certain part of the world where you get to see it change through the seasons, and so you know it intimately. Um, I think that's something I've certainly taken for granted before, but. Again, observation is pretty huge. Uh, and when I'm not making time for that stuff, then I realize why I'm creatively blocked or why I don't feel like doing anything. <laughs> yeah, very much the, the natural world and um, the stories, the people. Um, the book I'm working on next, I just finished a mu the book of a musical play. The, we were there when jazz was invented around a young Muskogee, mostly Muskogee Creek band. And, um, but it shows how our music is part of the origin story of blues, jazz, rock. But this band goes through a journey, road journey, to the Justice Fields, the main character's father who died, who was Homa Indian from uh, New Orleans. Congo Square was a, was a Homa village. And uh, there are still Homa people. I play with Greyhawk Perkins, lives down in New Orleans, Homa and Choctaw. Mm -hmm. And one of the last people who knows the Mobilian language. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing inspires me, is all these connecting stories everywhere. Every, everybody in here has a story. And if you were to start digging, I've started digging around in stories with family stories. It's amazing what you find. That's why some people don't dig around, I guess. But there's a story everywhere. There's a story about this building. There's a story about different laws. If law comes into being because there's a story behind it or a rule, there's some kind of story. Another thing I'm working on is a book for young women, letters about things I've learned or I've had so many teachers and I want to pass that on to granddaughters. But they're all our granddaughters. That's what those teachers taught is that they're all 
our granddaughters or grandchildren. So I get inspired by young people and what young people are doing in their, in their art, their imagining, um, their, their culture, because it tells us, you know, where we're going and I think, uh, you know, what's possible. And, and of course, always, um, I get inspired by stories of people who come up against the impossible and uh, who find beauty and make beauty. All kinds of, there are a lot of stories like that. Stories that, I started picking up on a story. My grandmother used to dream whole novels and sometimes I was in a whole dream the other night. It was a novel, watching this whole novel play out. And then I realized that that story could be uh, uh, this woman I saw on the street who people would bypass and think she's nothing, but embedded in her was this incredible, incredible story. So I was thinking maybe I will write that down. Yeah. But that's what, that's what happens. Some of it comes in during, you know, and it's, it could be related to the weather or where you're standing, the smell of, I've been recording the sounds of the insects outside. I'm going to put it in some of my music. It sounds a lot like our turtle shell rattles and all of that, just those sounds. Well, I hope when you walked out of the Library of Congress last night, you were recording because <laughs> whatever it was in the trees, it was very loud. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just want to add, too, that um, it's for inspiration, sources of inspiration. It's the Joy Harjo's yes. and the, the ones that came before us, in particular the native, I'm more in the kidlet world, but like Angeline Booley, who's here, uh, I'm really inspired by what um, the other uh, Native authors are creating today. They are creating such beautiful works and really just pushing the boundaries on what we think of as mm -hmm. like, you know, the genre Native fiction or Native children's lit. Uh, so that's really exciting. And, and the Native kid lit community is incredibly supportive and really great friends. And so mm -hmm. we all are inspiring each other. Yeah. Yes, I wish that sometimes I could go back in time and be um, in the generation listening just as a fly on the wall to Joy mm -hmm. and Simon and Lucy and just hearing what they were talking about <laughs> way back in the day. You don't want to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> like, I always tell these, ki these kids, they always think that they're up to something and we don't know. Yeah. I said, we were far, we were <laughs> adventurous. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> Well, it's okay to be adventurous. That's all right. Um, That's how you get the stories. <laughs> yes, exactly. This is how we get good stories. I know. I was very adventurous. There are more family stories about me because I was always getting into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I have I've begun to learn between some of their writings where they are intersecting and they're slyly telling us. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I get that now. I see. Um, but I really, I, I'm... I love how you talk about inspiration being outside, being um, in the environment, being in the elements. But I like how you talk about youth inspiring you. Because mm -hmm. that's, I think that we, I'm so inspired by youth and the mm -hmm. ways that they step up in certain instances, the ways that they are fearless, you know, yeah. adventurous in certain instances. What do we do to inspire youth? How can we, what are your thoughts about that? What was the question, what can... How can we inspire youth? What can we do more? Through this book specifically? Just in general, oh, oh, in your thoughts. Um, in terms of from like a writing and illustrating standpoint, I think it comes from um, keeping the kids at the center of it. It can be really easy to forget, especially when it's as an artist, you know, becomes sort of the self-indulgent thing at times. So you have to really be remembering to like, keep kids at the heart of it, uh, honoring um, honoring the, the young child and the inner child and the, the strong voice of a child. Uh, I think right now there's a lot of conversations in the publishing uh, world about, you know, sometimes we want to protect them too much and it doesn't really honor them because they are very smart and they get it and yeah. they get things. Um, sometimes they see things much clearer than we do. Um, and, and when you're a kid, the world can be an amazing, magical place, but it's also a scary place, and there's full of anxieties. Um, and when you're talking about, like, what things do you remember, the things that I really shocked me as a kid were the things that made me scared or just stuck in my brain and made me really anxious. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes remembering that and, and using that as a jumping-off point, so, so you're always sort of speaking to the child 
Um, and, and from an art and writing standpoint, it's remembering what the world was like to when you were a kid, um, that there is magic all around. Uh, and I just think speaking for the land too, I'm always amazed that kids, they connect with a lot of these stories and they don't need a whole lot of context or reasoning to, they just get it. Like with this book or We Are Water Protectors, they just understand. Um, and so it's just to continue giving them uh, ways to talk about it and to think about it um, and, and ways to help them learn how to connect with the land around them. Yeah, because every one of us still has that child. <clears throat> we, we are who we were then. I mean, yeah, we've evolved and grown and we go through the stages, you know, every, every human being to become a human, you know, become grown and so on. But that child is always within us. It's there, it's the root. But I think the best thing anybody can do is take care of their gifts. Everyone has their gifts. I loved hearing the stories last night at the opening event. And mm -hmm. that is it Angeline? Angeline? Angeline. Angeline. Yes, who wrote The Fire Keepers and has a new book out. She wrote that book. She got it published when she was 55 years old. You know, so think about that. A lot of, I didn't start playing sax till I was almost 40, saxophone. Is that it works both ways. Mm -hmm. And you know, doing art or practicing an art really has to do with reconnecting with the land, reconnecting with that spirit, with who you are, and uh, giving yourself that permission to be who you are. That was the wisest counsel I was ever given. And I remember when I first heard it, and I just thought, oh, that's easy. You know, of course, I didn't say it out loud. But it's not. And that's what art teaches. That art teaches you, and that's why we go to it in times of great transformation, especially. It's always there. But we, we go to it because we find ourselves, you know, in, we find ourselves in, you know, in those moments. We can find a place to land, a place to remember. So that would be the best gift, is, is to develop, to be who you are. You know, and to feed your spirit. We do that with poetry. We do, you know, and, and the student, and we need living, we need a living art, not just on the, and not fakey stuff on some lot that comes up on the internet. Not everything, I mean, the internet's useful, but um, it's, you know, feed yourself. I think the difference is you can feed yourself with processed food, which isn't technically food, or you could feed yourself with, with uh, food that's been, um, Maybe somebody has sang to the plants, or somebody has uh, thanked the fish, or, or you know has a relationship with. And it's there's a difference in in the nourishment that comes that comes from that. I think the same thing works with stories or music. If music has been uh, canned or, or or made specifically, yes, there can be art for for money. There can be art in it, of course. But is it going to, you know, what's going to feed your soul? That's why we're all here, is we're, you know, we get hungry. And having each other's company, too, this is great. That was a hard part of COVID, mm -hmm. was not being able to just hang out <laughs> and be with stories. Well, you know, you talk about that, and Joy, you were Poet Laureate during COVID, and you did talks virtual talks all over yes, I did. Um, <laughs> for many years, <laughs> which we were very grateful for. Um, what is it like to be post Poet Laureate and what advice do you have after kind of that experience? Yeah, that was totally unexpected. It was, I, I considered it a service position. All of our positions are service positions, really, if it comes down to it. And, and what I understood, you know, I came to understand that, you know, especially when we were going through together and what we are going through is that poetry became, we began to see the absolute necessity of, of poetry in our arts. And uh, so I was able to be helpful. I considered myself like the doorway. Okay, here's poetry. I'm going to open the door. And, uh, and yeah, I'm, and I'm not the only native poet. There are many. We're still alive, by the way, you know. <laughs> we still have, a lot of us still have our language. We have, you know. You know, it's so that was, you know, that was important too because that's part of the shift 
you know. The shifting that we're going through is basically, essentially a story shift. A shift in the story where all of our stories matter. Of course, when something important like that rises up into the consciousness, there are people who want to bring it down for control. Who will say, well, only some stories can be told. We're going to legislate. Mm -hmm. You can't legislate. Or it'll spill over. You can't stop the stories. You can for a while, or try to. But all the stories, all the stories matter. You can't make history not happen by not talking about it or by not sharing it. You know, we know, you know, just like being children, we know, you know what's, as a child, you know when something feels right and when it feels wrong. You know what, you, we, that's built in. But this is a crucial period and we need to know, you know, it's all, all the stories, the stories of the an different animals the stories of the water, the stories, there's, they all have stories. The stories of this land here, stories of our ancestors, it's all, that's sort of the place, we, that's where we are right now, especially in this, in this particular country. You know, sometimes I think there's a, uh, a trickster god who said, let's see what happens when we put everybody here together. <laughs> And in another world, the whales, the, whales, the whales are the ruling people. And maybe there's another world in which the ravens are the ruling people. So what would humans look like in that world, you see? So we're in this world. And because we, we, we consider ourselves predominant, but we're going to learn that we're not. <laughs> we are learning that. So it's a lot for us to think about. You can't get freaked out. I mean, you can, but where is it going to take you? You have to keep in mind that um, our time here is short, relatively short, and what do we want our lives to be, you know? I'd like to leave something nice behind, you know, and to feed the story. We're all feeding the story with our own lives, whether we think about it or not. Yeah, and I really like that this, you know, I like the thought of Trickster because I think Trickster's yeah. around all the time. Yeah. Everywhere I see Trickster on the metro every day as I go to work <laughs> <laughs> and back, my commute, that's, the, you know, the joy of riding the metro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, Michaela, you, um, you came through COVID. You have multiple books that you have illustrated or have covers that you illustrated. And um, if you have a chance, please go to the Alaska table. They have chosen one of Michaela's books as one of their uh, children's books for the year. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. And of course, Angeline Bully's book, Michaela illustrated the cover. Is there a message that you try to send with your illustrations? Uh, yeah. I kind of feel like every book I work on has some pretty common undercurrents. Um, I think Part of that is that I have the great privilege and honor to work with indigenous authors from all over the country and, and Canada as well. And, uh, and although we come from different, very unique, distinct tribes with different languages and cultures and stories and geographies, uh, there are some very common themes found throughout Indian country. And so I get to explore those kind of again and again um, in each book, and that's typically like how interconnected we are, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's through our stories or it's through our own individual relationship with the land, our relationship with community. Um, I love investigating this idea of home and what does it mean. I think so many of us are really hungry at our core for um, a deeply rooted sense of home and belonging, um, and I think like you talked about the time we're in, I think that's part of that. Uh, and I think so much can be healed is when we heal uh, our own relationship to, to community or to, to the land, it's also healing yourself. And so that's of, often at the, the core of a lot of the books I work on, whether they're in different parts of the country or not, you know, different uh, cultures or traditions. And I'm always speaking to different audiences as many artists and authors are, um, I'm speaking trying to speak directly to indigenous youth, and then speaking to non-native children as well, and then you're speaking to um, 
all Native peoples, and then you're speaking to all non-Native peoples, and you're speaking to children, and to parents, and caregivers, and grandparents, and librarians, and teachers, all sorts of educators. So you're trying to keep all of this in mind. What can all these different groups take away from these pieces you're working on? Uh, for Native children, it's very simple. I want them to feel seen, and I want them to feel celebrated, and that their stories matter. Like when you're asking, uh, how can we keep children inspired? Well, we can keep Native children inspired and engaged when we keep telling them that their voices are important, um, when the world so often tells them that they um, are unimportant or invisible. You know, these books can be lifelines um, for, for children to see themselves reflected. And so I try to keep Alaska Native children in mind and then Native children in general uh, and then non-Native children too. It just it works to grow empathy and compassion when we can uh, see all sorts of communities and like Joy, Joy was saying, all stories lifted up uh, and elevated and, and celebrated. Um, so yeah, that was a really long answer <laughs> to just what do you want to impart to children uh, and just that their voices matter, all children's voices um, and that their, their stories are worth sharing. Yeah, I like that. I like the, the idea that imagery, a young person can see an image and understand that as coming from their own culture and mm -hmm. somebody has put that out there for the rest of the world to learn and mm -hmm. see. And they see that book being shared and lifted up and, and used in different settings. You know, the, the books that I've worked on are used in preschools for very young children at story time. They're used in college, they're used in high school, they're used in master's programs. I mean, picture books really are for all ages and that's mm -hmm. something I really love about the art form. They're really unique in that sense. Mm -hmm. And picture books are often a child's first experience with art too, so that's something you try to keep in mind. Or poetry, you know, whatever you think of art, whether it's a visual, because they're reading the, the images when they're young, um, whether it's the poetry they're hearing or they start to read, um, you know, how do you keep them engaged? And what are we telling our children through these picture books? You know, we're telling them a lot when we exclude communities. Um, or we're telling them a lot when we misrepresent them. So, so there's all these, uh, these sort of forces at play. Yeah, I like that. You know, I wanna, we're gonna have the audience ask some questions, but before we do, I have one more question for both of you. What do we get to look forward to? What's coming next that we can get excited about from both of you? I, I already <laughs> mentioned I've got a third memoir that I will do after I do the, this book for young, young women, kind of an advice or letters for young, for young women. Mm. And um, then the, the play that will either be a movie or a play, and um, then a new music album, a couple. Um, I'm talking with a label right now. I might be doing one with Greyhawk Perkins, mm -hmm. nice. going back to that music. And um, man, what else? I've got a lot, a lot of stuff. You are a busy lady. <laughs> yeah, we're working on, we're working, I'm working in our community to help mentor young artists, mm -hmm. young Muskogee artists, you know, working with a group of Muskogee citizens on a project that would establish an organization to help with that. Um, there's a there's a lot. I mean, I've got a couple of music albums in the works, and these book projects, and then I'm also a mother, grandmother, mother, grandmother, and great grandmother, and of many, and that takes that's that's a big responsibility, especially when you're in a traditional community mm -hmm. too. And I acquire grandchildren along the way. <laughs> I do, you know, great, great, I have, I've acquired a lot. That's why I say I have many. You know, people ask me how many children do I have and I, it's hard to answer. But uh, yeah, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's just some of it and I've been wanting to get back to painting, mm -hmm. so. Um, I don't have nearly as much coming, <laughs> uh, but I have a few books. Um, the, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Tracy Sorrell. She's a Cherokee author, mm -hmm. um, awesome lady. Um, so yeah, we have a book coming out next spring or early summer, and hopefully I'll be getting down to Tulsa because okay. that's yeah, where she is. Yeah, and um, so it's based in Cherokee um, country about a child who's really excited to move, but they're moving back to their homelands. So it's sort of a spin on that classic moving book. Um, and then um, you mentioned the, the book with the, with the State of Alaska, Barry's mm -hmm. song. Um, 
I'm going to kind of keep working on that and do a seasonal type thing. So I have a few, um, few uh, self-authored ones that I get to work on next, which will be really fun. Cool. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you. We want to open it up to the audience. We have two microphones here on either side of the stage. Please come up, ask questions. Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting discussion. I like the point, remember. And for me, what very well conveyed the thoughts in the poem was the repetition of the word remember. And that brings me to my question, which is probably a hackneyed subject, but I'll mention it nevertheless. I grew up reading the English romantics, Wordsworth, Blake, Coleridge, Tennyson, and there was a certain simplicity, the certain cadence and the rhythm. Fast forward 50, 60 years, and now I struggle to read the poems in the New Yorker magazine, which is one of my favorite literary, which seems a lot of it is free verse, and it seems like turgid prose arbitrarily split up into stanzas. So I'm just wondering, is there a movement in current modern poetry against the old romantic rhyming? And what are your thoughts on that? Yes, the, those are most of those writers, not all of it was romantic, but yeah, there's a certain form, certain forms that, you know, that were, you know, I, you know, rhyming, rhyming schemes, forms, and so on that most people know as poetry. But in a lot of so-called free verse, and nothing is free, there's a form everywhere. There's all kinds of form. You know, a leaf can make a form. There's the golden, uh, what is, golden section. There's all, there's all kinds of forms in the world. So some of the forms, and I, I know I do this in, in my poetry, a lot of it is I go by rhythm. You know, I mean, that's, we all do. I mean, you're, when, you're, when you're speaking, too, that, of course, a poem condenses it. And sometimes the rhythms, there's a consistent rhythm and landing on certain, how would you say, it, syllo sy syllables that aren't always quite so discernible as the end rhyming. Now, that end rhyming happened so that people could memorize easier from a time where most poetry was not in books. And that helps, you know, it helps you memorize a lot easier. I think when books happen, then people started losing their memory. <laughs> that's my, that's the thing. When now you don't know your phone number, you, you know, you're not, you're not, your memory has no muscle to it. So I think that's part of it. But if you were to take some of those poems and really take them apart and listen to them, you will find all kinds of architectures happening within the poems that are, different than some of the rhymed verse. And that's, but thank you. Thank you. We'll come over here on this side. Excuse me, my name's Ishara Laxina. My question for you, Miss Joy and Miss Michaela, is why are, if all of our stories are important, why are some stories not spoken about and others turn out to be legends? Mm. <laughs> that's, a good that's a good question. That's a great question. <laughs> I think we're asking ourselves that a lot with all the book bans that are <laughs> yeah, going yeah. on these days. <laughs> no, that's an excellent question. And as we've been saying this, I thought about that too. There are some stories that are shameful. Mm -hmm. And you think, well, why do those need to be remembered? Because what happens if you hide something, you think you're hiding something, then it's going to appear. Sometimes it can be more dangerous. Those kind of stories can be dangerous. And if they appear just erratically, they can cause a lot of harm. But if you bring them up in a way that they, you know, that you have, there are people who know how to handle them and can bring them up that, in a way that they can be ultimately helpful and we can learn from them. And yeah, what makes a mythic story? Think about it. You know, that's a question for everyone. What makes a story mythical? It's somebody, um, doing something that seems impossible. And we're all capable of that. Yeah, that is a very good question. I'm trying to figure out how I can add to that. It's, I think some become legends and others are not held up as important because of who's been able to tell the stories. Mm -hmm. 
Um, right now, we're, we're certainly seeing that shift a bit more. And so we are seeing more everybody's stories are trying to be lifted up as well. And that's scaring people. And so people are trying to stuff that back down. And it's because we, not everybody has had the chance to tell these stories. It's, it's sometimes when I hear people talk about cliches or genre and writing and like we should move past that, like we're so overdone. It's not overdone until everybody has had an opportunity to even use those cliches or those genres. And I, I think so often we're not even at that point yet. Um, but that's certainly something, a question, your question is something I try to keep in mind when I work on these books. How can I help tell stories that celebrate Native peoples and how can those reach more people? How can I br build bridges in these stories that invite all readers in? And when all readers can see themselves in it, then it has a higher likelihood of it being um, spread around and lifted up. So I don't know if that really answers that. I think that's, I think that's stumping a lot of us right now, actually. Thank you so much for your question. We'll come over to this side. Thank you both for um, coming and speaking with us today. I'm super excited to actually see Joy Harjo in person. I, I grew up in Muskogee Nation in Oklahoma. Uh, so I saw the signs everywhere growing up. My best friend was growing up was Muskogee. Um, if you don't mind giving us a preview, I would love to hear uh, some of your, your top lines on advice for young women. Mm -hmm. My day job involves working with a lot of them mm -hmm. um, in a mentor role, um, and I'd, I'd love to hear some advice. Well, I'm working on that, but some of it, it was helpful to hear this young woman ask that question mm -hmm. because I was thinking, too, about what do you, how do you handle a story that's hidden or that's shameful? You know, how do you navigate those kinds of stories within ourselves or yourselves? That will be one. I, there's a lot I'm going to touch on in, in this, this book of letters. I keep thinking about Judy Bloom and how, you know, she was so groundbreaking and what she would deal with, you know, for young, young women. And so I'm thinking, well, you know, this, this isn't fiction, but I want to touch on those things that really matter and that we, you know, struggle with as young women and even into, even into now. Yeah. But thank you. Thank you. We'll come on the side. My name. Okay, um, I said hi. Um, I said hi. My name is Miriam. I I got crushed for years because 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 um, mommy was um, mommy was a teacher at librarian like you. Um, 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 do you um do you um um do you teach the kids your school up with with the books? I, I go to school sometimes. I'm going to, next Tuesday, I go to a school in Stringtown, Oklahoma. They wrote to me and said they had 75% Native children, so I said I would come down and speak with them. And then my sister used to teach, she taught for years at Liberty Mound School, Liberty Schools in Oklahoma, and I would go in when I would, I live back home now, but I would go in every time I came into town and, uh, read to the kids, talk to them, and, um, and so I saw them growing up, and I remember them coming, running up to me as little kids, and then they grew into, you know, now they have kids of their own. Thanks. Uh-huh, thank you. Michaela, do you ever go in schools? And um, I'm doing it increasingly, now that COVID is, you know, we've moved on a little bit from it, but um, I had a lot of my books come out during COVID, so mm -hmm. school visits are still very daunting <laughs> to me, but uh, I'm, I'm slowly doing more of them. Uh, it, next month I'll be going to northern, western, northwestern Alaska and um, going to Nome and Bethel communities okay. and uh, going to primarily um, Alaska Native School and then got to go down to uh, a reservation school in Washington. Um, Oh my gosh, I'm drawing a complete blank. It was north of Bellingham, mm -hmm. new, new region for me, but I got to go visit with them and that was incredible. Uh, so I'm just starting to get back out there or get out there, I guess, for the first time. Yeah, thank you. Come on this side. Joy, I have a question for you. What inspired you to do poetry? 
Yeah, I had no plans to do poetry, and even as much as I loved it, I went to, I got into Indian Art School to the Institute of American Indian Arts when it was a Bureau of Indian Affairs high school, mostly, based on art. And it wasn't until I was a student at the University of New Mexico and involved in Native rights movements and was meeting a lot of poets around, like um, Simon Ortiz, Leslie Silco, and, and Laura Tohey and Lucy both were students. Lucy and I, I mean, Laura and I were both art students. But I started writing poetry, and it took over. It surprised me. I fought it. I didn't want it to. I preferred doing art and not having to talk to people. <laughs> I was very shy. But um, it, it, it took over, and I knew that it was something. I knew without knowing why I knew or how I knew that it was a path I had to follow. One more question. So what do you like about poetry? Oh, man. I don't know where I start, but it's the compactness and the exactness and that it, it's, a, it's a pathway with words. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yep, we have one. Okay. Hi, thank you. Um, it was storytelling that brought me to a love of literature. I'm here, obviously. Um, my question is, you mentioned um, that on reservations when you were growing up, there were no libraries. Um, the library was a safe place for me. It was my closet. I went into closets as well as a child. People would talk to me at the library. It was a quiet space. Um, are there now, um, as far as you know, libraries on reservations, um, I didn't know if that was a thing now. I'm a, I'm a librarian, I haven't been in libraries for a while, but um, that's something that I thought about. Yeah, so I mean. You can answer that yeah. one, Shelley. <laughs> well, Navajo Nation now has a very large library um, in our capital in Wonder Rock. Not all of the small communities have public libraries. It's okay. still the school library that kind of is the, is the only the resource, but. Okay. Yeah, and different communities. I mean, you guys can talk about your community. We don't have reservations in Alaska, so just grew up with a couple of public libraries in our city. Okay, yeah. just access. The tribal colleges do. We have yeah. the College of the Muscogee Nation, and then my library that I came to was in a shopping little shopping mall over at Pine and Harvard. Mm -hmm. and oh. That's, you know, that's, that's where I would go. I'm and in the school, our schools, our public schools had libraries. Just access to libraries is something yeah. I think about. And I grew up somewhere where bookmobiles would come oh, yeah. to our neighborhoods mm. and we'd all get very excited. So um, they're just just—they're also just a safe place for kids and weird kids. Um, weird kids, but um, so I was just wondering. Yeah. So. Thank you. Yeah. We have one more question. Oh, thank you. I was trying to get my nerve up sitting <laughs> over here. <laughs> um, I'm a school librarian from Montgomery County Public Schools. Um, part of uh, my library has, in the last few years, included a nature brary, and now we've built an outdoor classroom in our courtyard. And this year, one of my uh, goals is to do um, a land acknowledgement, and I was wondering if you have any tips or advice, or if that's even appropriate, and how would I go about that? I would find the native people who are indigenous to the area for that and ask them. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I have to say, <laughs> thank you, Joy. Thank you, Michaela. Thank you for the work that you have done. Thank you for bringing poems to life for us and Michaela for uh, drawing those out the, in a way where we can see them and we can feel the words of joy, we can feel the work that is being put forward. Mm -hmm.